Hello, everybody. You're very welcome tonight to Trasnatera. Tonight we are we've got we're we're joined by an esteemed historian and a broadcaster from uh, Virginia, Charlottesville, called uh, Kevin. What's his surname? Levy. Uh, how is it? Don Levy. Don Don Levy. Um, Kevin has uh, lectured at a number of universities, University of Virginia, University of Richmond, and a few years ago he brought out a brand wee book, which I still haven't got my hands on, but I mean to, The Early Irish in Virginia from 1600 to 1860. So I'll just pass you over to Kevin now, who's going to tell us a wee bit about who's included in the book and a few wee stories. So I'll... Okay, Kevin, thank you very much for joining us tonight from Virginia. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to join you and Liam live. And we're doing something on this end now <laughs> so that we can show this. Yep. Okay. Yep. You can see it. Oh, really? Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is show two books. This is this is the one that I, that I wrote, The Irish in Early Virginia, 1600. To 1860, I stopped before the American Civil War because, Jesus, that's that's an entirely different topic. Um, but one reason I'm, I'm showing the cover, for anybody who might be curious, is there there's a very dapper young guy on the front cover, and this is the only known likeness. It's an oil painting of a man named Emmett. So this is Professor John Patton Emmett whom President Thomas Jefferson hired to teach on the first faculty of the brand new University of Virginia. And for those who don't recognize his name, he's one of those Emmets. It was his uncle, Robert, who was hanged and decapitated. So this, this fellow's father uh, is T.A. Emmett. And so the, so the connection between this fellow and the revolutionary image was very, very strong. Now we'll go in later on, we'll go into, into why Thomas Jefferson hired this fellow and, and, he, and he taught natural sciences. He taught the equivalent of geology and chemistry, I suppose. And we'll talk about some of his pets because he had a pet bear and that's a separate story in itself. So if anybody is interested in, 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 the, in the wee book, you can buy it from the, the publisher that's Pocahontas Press. But I also want to give a plug for the book that got us here in the first place. And that's a book that Stephen himself might recognize since, since he and Colin put it together. It's been very, very useful to me. And for anybody who's listening, who has even the slightest inkling of interest in um, the Ireland of the 1790s. It's a book that you really ought to get your hands on because it's full of a lot of anecdotal material. It's full, it's full, of, um, it's full of short snippets about who in Ireland got the hell out when General, General Lake was doing his nastiness and how they sort of found themselves on, on a bark or some, some sort of large ship and went to the new world. It's a handy book, and Stephen and and Colin can tell you how to get your hands on that. I suppose supposedly there's some more copies of it left. So we're going to talk about first, keeping an eye on the time, why Irish people came to the state of Virginia in the new world in the 1600s. Oh, they did, Kevin. Oh, yes, they did. Um, you can easily find online, as well as in my book, a listing of about 400 Irish individuals. And, and it's Bridget so-and-so, it's Darby so-and-so. And there's, there's not much information about them, but, but they arrived in Virginia now, not New York, not Boston, not Florida. They arrived in Virginia for some reason in the 1740s, no, sorry, the 1640s and the 1650s. So we know what was happening in Ireland in those days. You know, something like 500, 4,000 people slaughtered. Can we believe that figure? 
Yes, we have to, because that's what historians have had told us. And it was William Petty, I think, who actually came up with that figure. 504,000 Irish people slaughtered by the, by the Redcoats and by the yeomen. So a lot of people said, let us try the new world. Let us find out how to get to the new world. And unless you could swim and avoid sharks, you had to get yourself aboard uh, a leaky wooden craft crammed into the storage area down below, which was very nice. Very, very pleasant down below. You could hang out with all your neighbors in the dark and very smelly down below. And you were aboard ship in the 1600s and you had never seen a ship in your life. You'd never seen the wee ocean in your life. You had no idea what sharks and what the fishes were like. And so you also didn't know what it was like to be aboard a ship. You didn't know what it was like in those days to be aboard a ship for two months and three months without stop. So these several hundred Irish people, when they got to the shores of America, thought to themselves, oh, so that's what it was like. Jesus wept. It was pretty horrible, pretty horrible. So what are we going to do now? Most of the people who arrived in those days in, from Ireland had never seen a map. Their ability to speak to anybody in English was very, very limited because they were, they were Gale Gores, you know, they spoke, they spoke Irish. And they didn't know what they would do for a living. They were off the family farm um, and they didn't bring any tools along with them because they just wanted to get out to escape with their lives. And so of those three or 400 people, <laughs> and the listing of them online is, is uh, it's, it's very useful if you want to start there. We know almost nothing about that particular, that particular set of people. We know that they arrived in Virginia. We know that they probably, um, they probably either came up the Rappahannock River um, on, that, on that, that vessel that they were on and got off at one or two of the little, little port towns in Virginia. But they all seem to have disappeared unless somebody is going to start sometime soon. And it's not going to be me, I don't think, trying to track down those, those hundred names. But trying to track somebody after three or 400 years is pretty, pretty dicey, dicey situation. Like trying to, to track those Sullivans or, or McClickens who disappeared centuries ago. So what I did um, with this book was to sort of stumble into a research methodology and, and, and the methodology turned, to be some, turned out to be something that, that, I, that I sort of thought about later on. I started going to various towns in Virginia and we need to keep in Virginia, keep in mind folks that in Virginia, you have a state that's a single state now that's larger than all of Ireland. As I recall, Ireland's what, 32,000 square miles. And, and Virginia, which is one of the larger American states, it's 43,000. That's a vast difference. And it was, it was sort of a gas. I enjoyed doing it, but I went, went to all sorts of places in Virginia, large and small, cities like Charlottesville and Richmond and Winchester. Um, and, and I just sort of went to the local, first of all, I went to the local libraries and went to the local history section. And I'm sure this is familiar ground to any fellow researchers there. And you, you just look for little, little wee books or little, little wee pamphlets that'll tell you who married so-and-so in the 1700s. And, and that information, as far as the 1700s, is fairly common in any, in any library in Virginia or probably um, the other early states too. And somebody usually has been conscientious enough in the past to say, well, let's see, no, I'm going to write a little book about everybody who got married in, in, the, in, you know, in, the, in the county of Albemarle, and this is Albemarle. That, that we live in now. And I'm just going to go through the, through the archives and see who married whom. And so in, in case after 
in town after town, I would do that approach. And I always found little listings of, of people who had died and people who had married and without trying to go into any sort of church records. I never went into Presbyterian records or, or Anglican records. I did go into one, one, one Catholic church record uh, in, the, in the town of Stanton or Staunton, you might say. And I'll talk about that. And so it, it's, it's been surprising to me to see the number of people in various towns and counties in Virginia, which isn't really known for being a bastion of, uh, of Irish people, unlike uh, Massachusetts or New York or, or, or Connecticut, um, to see that in the early days in the 1600s and the 1700s in particular, Irish people, there are Irish people galore here. And um, from the earliest days of Irish people showing up in this town, in Charlottesville, we have to go back to the early 1700s when Charlottesville was not even a village. There were only about 200 people living here. And some people had money. Some people, um, like the Coles family, C-O-L-E-S, uh, the Coles family who settled here did not settle in the town in the 1700s, they settled in, in what's called the Green Mountain section of um, just south of Charlottesville. And they, they, they came with gold galore, I think. They were, they were the Coles family, that lot came originally from England and they settled in Enniscorty and they bought up all the land that they could in Enniscorty and Two or three of them became uh, what's the word, Port Port Reeves, and they sort of controlled trade in and out of of Enniscorty. And then, for some reason, um, some of them came in the 1730s and 1740s to Virginia, and a few of them came in the 1790s, and they were getting out in the 1790s, and we know the reason for that. But the one, but the Coles people who who came in the 1730s and 1740s came first to the city of Richmond in Virginia, and they bought land galore there, and they were they were really early capitalists, and they wanted to make a killing, and they did. And they were buying bits of land in the town of Richmond, and they were dividing it up into into so many acres, and they were selling that as sort of an early housing development made enough money out of that that within a decade or two, they said, ho-hum, we don't want to live in the city of Richmond anymore. Ho-hum, it's, um, it's too crowded. Let, let us return to our rural roots. And so they did. They came up here to Charlottesville, to Charlottesville and to, especially to Albemarle County, and they bought land, a lot of land. And um, the, the early sort of the progenitor, the father of all these people named Coles, started building houses for his sons and daughters. And these are, they're magnificent houses and they're still up today. They're all red brick because everything in Virginia seems to be made of red brick. And they have plenty of white columns and there's, they sort of belong to the federal period of architecture. And I think I think those of you who are interested in Irish history will be curious to know that the the first of these of uh, these manorial houses that um, the Coles family built up was was called the house now was called was called Enniscorty. Really, it's true. And Enniscorty stands today, even though the original one was wood and it burned down. But Enniscorty stands today as sort of a monument to what people who came with money to Virginia could do. And, and, I, and I'm really interested in the Coles family because they, they were English, they came to Ireland, they made a killing, um, so to speak, they made a killing in property. And they made a killing when they came over here. And they were people that were of the same social class as President Thomas Jefferson, and that and that lot, but some of the Coles people, um, my research indicates, um, have a, the ones that remain 
behind it, and Escorti had a tough time. There were two or three of them who were engaged in, um, in fighting against the dastardly rebels of 1798. And some of the Coles people, unlike the ones who came to Virginia and got out, some of those Coles people actually got locked up probably um, in the building. I think, I think there was a prison at the time um, right in, in, in Escorti town. And so that's the saga of uh, the Coles family. The ones that stayed in, in Escorti ended up uh, in, in prison. Uh, fair play to them. And the ones that came to America have made a, have made a fortune. And so I, I, I told you about the methodology, how I would go from community to community, trying to, oops, trying to track any Irish people, or at least Irish surnames that showed up. I never tried to deal with, with questionable names like Barrett or Bennett or Stevens. It, I mainly tracked um, Gaelic uh, surnames because that's, that's an easier thing to do. So uh, let me give you a couple of snippets at this point of, um, some, um, of some of the chapters and see if I can catch your, catch your interest here. The book does start off with a with a, a discussion about um, Irish emigration to America, and contained in there um, um, are, I think, I hope, well reasoned remarks about did the Irish in the early days come over as um, as apprenticed servants or were they slaves? And so, and some people, can, as you know, consider it sort of a sort of a hairy question. Well, you know, when people were slaves, not only were they usually black, but you know, they were slaves for life. They never were able to get out of slavery in America. Whereas the Irish and other people who came over um, and signed in indentures um, only served apparently five, six, seven years, and then those Irish and other um, and other groups were free to go. Well, that's that's the way it sort of was was supposed to be. Um, it certainly is true that that, that um, only on rare occasions were black people in America ever allowed to buy their freedom. You know, it was considered a dumb thing to do to let your slave start saving money. Because if the slave said at one point, well, master, I suppose I give you a thousand dollars, will you turn me loose? Well, then you've lost a slave. In the 1700s, um, in, in some of the local newspapers in, in Virginia, um, whenever a slave would run away or whenever a, um, an indentured person would would run away. Um, there are various notices being posted in the local newspapers saying, so and so just left me, and I want to, to get him back or get her back. So I thought I would do what I would do is if I could find is find a brief uh, description or two of what these what these sections in the in the newspaper were all about. And I hope that'll catch. Your interest. This is mainly material that you you wouldn't be able to find unless you were living in the living in the living in the states. You would think I would find this very fast, since since, <laughs> since, it's, since it's a book that I wrote. But I'm obviously just taking my time about it because I've really forgotten where where all those descriptions are. Okay, Marco, you can find these things from. No, Kevin. <laughs> That's not the way it works. Well, I think we're going to have to skip there for, for, a, for a few minutes and come back to it since I can't. Ah, I did find it. I promise you, did, not, did I not? Fellow historians and those of you who can still read and write, I promised you a couple of descriptions of runaways and these are descriptions of Irish runaways 
not German, not Italian, but these are some Irish folks. Now here is one about Edward Ormsby. And as the newspaper ad goes, well, the newspaper uh, notice goes, Edward Ormsby is a small, thin fella of a swarthy complexion and is a tailor by trade. He has a hesitation or stammering in his speech and being an Irishman has a good deal of the brogue. I think at that point to have a brogue was an insult. And here's another one about a, a guy named Hoy. And this appeared in 1745 in a newspaper in Virginia. He ran away from the subscriber in Prince George County, an Irish servant man named Thomas Hoy, aged about 41 years, of a middle stature with a scar under one of his eyes and some scars on his head. His little finger of his left hand has been broke and is very crooked. He is very much given to strong drink and he lisps when he is in liquor. He plays well on the violin and pretends to teach dancing. He, uh, here's part of the best part. He took with him when he went away a large gray gelding, a fine saddle and bridle, a light colored broadcloth coat, two check shirts, a pair of boots, one brown, and one small black wig, and a pair of leather breeches patched between the thighs. So this, this guy Hoy had done some planning and he decided he wanted to get away from his master. And maybe he didn't want to last seven years. Maybe he, at the end of seven years, wasn't being released by the, ma released by the master. We don't know that. But he did some, he did some planning anyway. Now, now there's a woman named Catherine Russell. She is a, a short, thick, young Irish woman, about 18 years of age, of a red complexion. She had on when she went away, a new brown linen petticoat and old cotton ditto and an old cotton waistcoat. Um, there was an ad for um, a 15 year old, imagine now a 15 year old in, ser in servitude, Edmund Butler. He is a servant lad, he was born in Cork age 15 years, he is about four feet, six inches high of a fair complexion. And the next year in 1746, again in Virginia, there was a master who complained um, that he had lost his indentured fellow, his indentured servant. And this is the way that the master complained in the newspaper. He is a short, sly fellow, talks with the brogue, has black hair and is very handy, either as a planter, a ditcher, a butcher, a gardener, or a carter. Best part, he took with him a pair of leather bags, well stuffed, and plenty of money not his own. He has four years and a half to serve. And this is what I had to write after the description of, of all of these indentured servants. This will tell you about my politics, I suppose. Let us say farewell and good luck to these errant souls. Perhaps they were overworked and vilified. Perhaps they wanted to be free of all English manipulation, whatever. Perhaps they were, as the masters did, aver lazy and up to no good and blasphemous, blasphemous idolaters and the like. Let us hope that they prospered and found contentment. So that that will sort of that will sort of tell you that um, those who were Irish indentured servants did not always last a long time. They didn't want to last a long time. Um, now other commentators have pointed out that um, those who were indentured in the New World were treated as badly as black slaves were. One reason being that the indentured person is being paid, granted a minimal sum, and granted he's given given a meal or two every day, and granted granted he is or she is given a room in the 
in the attic of the house where it's roasting hot in the summer, roasting freezing in the wintertime. So the indenture folks were not always happy. Sometimes, sometimes they were thinking, if I can just stick it out, oh Jesus, I can just stick it out and stick away a few dollars, you know, a few pounds, I will do that. But the, but the masters could beat them. The masters could sell them. The masters could do anything that they, they wanted to, apparently, during the period of servitude. So um, they, they could be beat. I mean, we're talking about beatings with leather straps now and leather and leather whips. They could be beat within an inch of their lives, just as, and it's an important point, I think, just as, as the black slaves could be beat within an inch of their lives too. But the master who was hiring this woman or that man to work in the house or to work in the fields, clearing trees and stumps, um, did not have a, an initial high monetary investment in that person. Whereas the, the, the person like Mark here, or like me, just joking, just, just joking. Um, anybody who, who bought a slave um, had, a, had what we consider a, in these days a sort of a, a, really, a really high investment um, in the neighborhood of $1,000 or $1,200 or $1,500. If you bought a slave, you didn't want to overwork the slave to the point that the slave died. No, no, because you would lose your thousand dollar investment. And you didn't want to starve the state, sorry, the slave, <clears throat> because then you would lose your thousand dollar investment. And so maybe one thing that you could do if you were um, a white Irish male, if you can see where I'm going, Let's just see if you can produce on the sly um, more little slaves, more little slavettes. And I'll leave that to your imagine, imagination how you do that. You don't buy slave infants. You bring them up with your own loins. Because in the, in the tenets and rubrics of slavery in, in America, any slave that had children, whether they were boy children or girl children, those children were slaves. And when the English and then and then the Americans finally decided in the early 1800s to outlaw slavery, it was certainly um, a big a big sigh of relief in the black population saying, no more master, no more mistress. I am going to eventually get my freedom or my kids or my grandkids will, will get the freedom. So we talked a little bit about the, about, about the Irish indentured people. And um, I wanted to give you a, a little bit of a taste of, of what up in the town of Winchester, uh, which is a town in, in very much sort of the northern part of Virginia, um, what life was like there for Irish people. The, the most prominent family there, and even to this day, is the family of Maguires. And the, the, the initial Maguire showed up um, in the town of Winchester in the 1700s, and he was Edward Maguire. And I found that he was from Kerry, um, from near Tralee, he came from Ardford in Kerry. Now, why he came to Virginia, we don't know. But, but Edward McGuire um, left Ireland in 1746. Um, he landed at Philadelphia, and very soon he came down to northern Virginia. He bought, bought a sizable bit of land there, and within, within five or ten years, Edward came to own, own more than 6,000 acres. So he was very, he was doing very well. I suspect that, that, that he and maybe a few other Maguires came over with, with some money in their pockets. Um, and so he was able to, uh, to, to buy a good bit of land. 
And one of the first things that, that he did was to put up, after he'd made a good bit of money, was to put up money, something like, I don't think we have a figure here, uh, a good bit of money anyway to erect the first Catholic church in Winchester. And then in 1777, he became a justice in the county legal system. So he was doing very well. And nobody ever has any uh, any bad thing to say about the Maguires that I've been able to find. But the, uh, and a local historian named William Russell uh, wrote a book about the Irish in early Winchester. And he has this to say about the Maguires. Some 60 years ago was seen standing on a bluff, a small one-story house occupied by an Irishman named Maguire, an old revolutionary soldier. Many a lick did the boys receive over the head for making sport of him. His wife was known as Blind Molly and was considered a good old woman. So it's a, it's a nice little slice of the slice of life, a little tranche de vie of this guy, Maguire. And we don't know which Maguire he was, but at least there's that bit of a, of a tidbit about this Maguire in this particular town of Winchester. Um, he married a woman named Millicent Doby, and when she died, he married somebody else. But just listen to the, the, the Irish surnames of people who get married in the 1700s, not any other century, but in the 1700s in the town of Winchester. John Sullivan, John Connor, uh, Mary Hogan, Patrick Doherty, James Ryan, um, Ann Barton, Bernard Fagan, Michael Kehoe, Edward McGuire again, this is wife number two, I suppose, Rebecca Farrell, and Mary Kelly. So that's just in a period of 1774 to 1799, 25 years, and you've got a dozen people or more of Irish connection out in the town of Winchester, which is at, at in those days, a pretty remote place to, to tell you the truth. There were a, a lot of Irish connections in Winchester. And in fact, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's an Irish Catholic cemetery in, uh, in Winchester. And it's called the Sacred Heart Cemetery. And um, in 1900, um, a local person up there cataloged all the gravestone inscriptions in Winchester County and Frederick County. And in, um, in this particular graveyard, um, and we'll talk about a prominent person buried there that reflects on Stevens and Collins, but um, there are at least 150 Irish people buried there from the 1700s and from the 1800s. 150 people now, that's, that's a fair amount in this one little, one little town in Virginia. So among the earliest of the people buried in Sacred Heart Graveyard is Patrick Denver from the county down, who was born about 1746, as we know in Colin and Stephen's book, and he dies in 1851. There's a man named Kenton, sorry, Fenton, who came from County Cork. Uh, I get um, some people named Burns, who came from the Ladies Island in County Wexford. There's a John Fagan. He's from uh, Temple of Shando Parish in the County of Waterford. And there are people from, uh, there's somebody from Valley Castle, who is a, a woman named Mary Ann Clark. She was born in 1798 in Valley Castle. There are um, other Cork people buried there. There's John Doran from Crowbeg in, 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 in Donegal. There's a man named Nellis from Donegal. There's a wife named Annie, married to him, and she's from Tyrone. Five or six other people from Donegal. Now, why people from Donegal came to Winchester, we don't know at this point. There's a guy named Mannion, John Mannion, who's from the Galway. Yeah, from County Galway. 
buried at the age of 32. It's easy for me to get wrapped up in, in, in this book once again. Um, one of the people who, 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 who is mentioned in, um, in the United Irishman here is a man named Douglas, Adam Douglas, who uh, the Douglases were United Irish emigrates who, who fled to this country. And, and one of the Adam Douglases, there were two people named Adam Douglas, I think, at least two. He wrote a book called The Irish Emigrant. And it's about, it's about his showing up in, uh, in America and um, having fled things happening in 1798. And he, and he actually wrote a book, that book that I just told you about, The Irish Emigrant, subtitled An Historical Tale Founded on Fact by an Hibernian. So the hero in the book is a guy named, I read it myself, it's a great book. The hero in the book, the fictional hero is Owen McDermott. And he has a father named Brian McDermott, again in the novel, who owns land in the county Antrim. And the land is described as, quote, immediately on the shores, which were washed by the waters of the romantic and beautiful lake called Loch Ney. So this, 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 this guy who writes the book um, lives on Loudon Street for a, for a while in, in Winchester. And he travels around the USA a good bit and his hero does the same thing. Now, when the hero comes to America in the book, he discovers this. And remember that Columbia is another name faithful listeners to um, another name for America. In Colombia alone, there was true liberty, except in one instance where it is true. Uh, sorry, let me start that again. In Colombia alone, there was true liberty, except in one instance, which it is true was a disgraceful one, that a part of the human species are held in bondage and that of the most ignominious description merely in consequence of their differing in color from their own fellow creatures and being much less refined than they who pretend to Christianity, but still vindicate the base doctrine of slavery. So here's the, here's the book written um, in 1817, about the time that the so-called civilized countries are thinking about outlawing slavery. So I thought you might enjoy that. Let's talk a little bit about, um, about Thomas Jefferson and the United Irishmen. And I think that's one of the few um, original things I was able to put together in the book. We all know who Wolf Tone is, if we know any Irish history. We all know who Thomas Jefferson is, if we know any American history. Thomas Jefferson, who had two terms, I think, in the presidential office. One of the things I was able to find out by going through a listing of Thomas Jefferson's um, was that, that he had either 24 or 25 books that focused on Irish history. Um, I think they were all probably published in either Dublin or London. And some of them are, are fairly early. And there's a book, for instance, of the speeches of John Philpot Curran. As you remember, the great attorney, the barrister who defended so many United Irishmen who were up on sedition charges in the 1790s. John Philpott Curran himself, as you know, being a court man, and he never joined the United Irishmen, but he was very close to them politically. So why do we bring up John Philpott Curran? Well, because Thomas Jefferson must have had a reason for buying some of his, some of his speeches. 
the speeches are 18th century prose, restoration prose. So they're, they're kind of tough to wade through, but what you can see is that by looking just barely below the surface, you can see that John Philpott Curran and Thomas Jefferson had similar ideas about tyranny and about um, uh, slavery, of course, um, with Jefferson, but that they, well, they just had similar ideas. And so that's one of the books that Thomas Jefferson had and the historian on, on the, and the university faculty here told me once that uh, Thomas Jefferson never bought a book that he didn't read. He didn't just buy a book and stick it up on the shelf and say, I'm gonna read that next week. Um, he would order a book, buy a book, and he would read it right away. So he had 24, 25, 25 books in his, in his collection. And some of them were a little, a little bit more, keeping it out of time. Some of them were typical um, of the time. For instance, there is a book by John Daly Burke, The History of Virginia from its First Settlement to the Present Day, published in Petersburg, Virginia in 1804. So here's John Daly Burke, a friend of Emmett and a United Irishman himself who got the hell out and came to America to avoid the hangman's rope. Uh, and he always had his finger in, in a pie or another. And when, for whatever reason, John Daly Burke decided to write a history of Virginia, he actually had the nerve to talk to President Thomas Jefferson and borrow materials from, from him, from Jefferson, that he used in writing his history of Virginia. Now, keep in mind that uh, Burke never grew up in Virginia. He didn't know much about Virginia, so he had to really scratch the surface to find books that he could, could consult. And the fact that Jefferson not only lent him material, but bought copies of the books and read them is very interesting because John Daly Burke was really, a, he was really an agitator. And there are, there's, all, there's all sorts of material in these books talking about, um, about English repression in Ireland and how he doesn't want to see that continue in America. So there's, there's a lot of agi political agitation there. Now, for instance, um, Jefferson had a copy of Sir Henry Cavish's, uh, Cavendish's Public Accounts of Ireland, dated 1791. There's a man named Henry Grattan, whom we know, who wrote a book called The Present State of Ireland, published in Philadelphia, over here in 1797. Um, two books from prominent UI sources, James McNevin's book, which has a, an interesting title, Pieces of Irish History, illustrative of the condition of the Catholics of Ireland, of the origin and process of the political system of the United Irishmen, and of their transactions with the Anglo-Irish government. And so this is published 1807 in New York, and um, sorry, I just flew away there for a second. McNevin sent a copy of his book down to Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson actually turned around after he had started reading it, sent a, sent a note to this, this um, United Irishman, this seditious rebel, thanking him for the book. Which I thought was a nice touch. And, but now it's safe to assume that Thomas Jefferson read that book written, written by another Irish American. Um, hmm. Jefferson also had, had a copy of the book written by Sir William Petty called, over here, it's called Political Survey of Ireland, dated 1719. But for those of you who are demanding historians, um, we know that the original title of the book was The Political Anatomy of Ireland, 
and it was dated 1691. This is the same William Petty, as you might remember, who did the, the, um, the down survey in, in Ireland. So another interesting book that I, I think interesting that, that uh, got sent to President Jefferson was that written by William Sampson. And it's called Memoirs of William Sampson, including a short sketch of the history of Ireland, particularly as it respects the spirit of British domination in that country. Again, that's dated 1807. So Samson was a, a clever enough fellow that he figured that he could send the, that he should send a copy of his book down to President Jefferson. He too got a, a wee note of thanks from Thomas Jefferson saying, thanks, thanks very much for the book. I'll have a I'll have a read of it. So Jefferson um, had a a very very slight interest in Ireland, but it was always there. And keep in mind that um, it's, it's, things were about to happen in Washington D.C. as well as Charlottesville. You remember that at one point, somebody living in Jefferson's house, Monticello looked out the window one Sunday morning and said, Jesus, God, President, President Jefferson, you need to get out of this house. The Redcoats are, are driving their horses up Monticello Mountain and they will put the rope around your neck for being a seditious, a seditious melt. Jefferson looked out the window, saw the Redcoats, got on his horse and went flying away, actually to stay in with the Coles family for safety. And we need to keep in mind too that, that, that only a few years later, it was Redcoats themselves who burned the White House in, in Washington, the house of the president. So Jefferson was not entirely enamored of British, um, of British happenings, and um, particularly as they affected life in Ireland, and more particularly as they were to be affected toward people living in the US. I think it's safe to say that Wolf Tone only got, uh, as one historian points out, he only got introduced to um, the American ambassador um, appointed to Paris because of influence by Thomas Jefferson. I think Jefferson having studying enough of Irish history, having read enough commentary on Irish history, decided, well, the English are certainly getting their way and they're slaughtering people in 1798 and let's see what we can do to help. So my theory is that, that Thomas Jefferson influenced the ambassador who just happened to be a guy who went to law school with at William and Mary College, just happened to be uh, the fellow who lived next door on the farm next to his, and that, that's James Monroe. So Monroe is the, is, the, is the ambassador resident in Paris who gets nudged, I think, um, although there's no documentary evidence at this point. He, I think he get, gets nudged by his neighbor, Tom Jefferson, saying, come on, James. You know, let's strike a blow for freedom. When, when you talk to this fellow Wolf Tone, keep in mind that Wolf Tone represents the entirety of the United Irish struggle in Ireland against uh, British domination there. So um, if you read David Wilson's book, you'll see that he remarks a little bit about, about the ambassador, but, but since he doesn't live in Virginia, he wouldn't have come across the idea that Thomas Jefferson himself would have tried to do his part in the struggle, you know, the one struggle, many fronts, as people used to say. Well, now, I think um, Stephen and Liam, th that I'll stop right there, and particularly if we have any 
any commentary or questions we can, any queries we can try to deal with that. Hey, Kevin. Uh, that was Brian. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind um, taking a wee stab at them, you know. Um, at the start of the lecture, you started, or you uh, talked a wee bit about indentured servants. Was there any kind of time period that an indenture lasted for? We mean the number of years that indentureship covered it. I don't really know. Steve, I really don't know when indentureship came into being. I don't know when it was when when it was phased out. But how long did the indenture stay that way? When was he? Was it for ten years or was it for twenty years? Or well, I see what you're getting at. And I think that I think the I think Mark Mark is right, and I agree that was most of them were for seven years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you also said about slaves, um, when they had a child, it was a slave. When an indentured servant had a child, was that an indentured child? No, that, that child was, was completely free. Okay. So far as I know from, from, from what I've read. Yeah. Um, Virginia, it was kind of like the entry point to America, was it? In many ways, I, I think Massachusetts and Virginia were the two best known entryways in those early days. Yeah. And um, the fact that Jefferson intervened in Wolf, Wolf Tone in Paris and a lot of other issues, uh, do you think he was doing that because he was trying to please his own uh, population in Virginia and around the Washington area who were primarily Irish? Right. Oh, I, I, what, what was your question? Do you Sorry. think he was doing he was doing that um, to try and gain votes? Mm -hmm. Don't know. Okay, I, I never thought never thought about that before. Right. Tone Tone did spend some time in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, right? I think he even bought a maybe bought a farm at one point. And after a while, he just shook his head saying, I don't belong here. Yeah, he famously uh, said that he got swindled in America when he bought the farm. And then after a few months, he, he left. At least even he, he didn't buy the farm in the sense of dying. Do you know that expression? She bought the farm. <laughs> Maybe it's just an, an American expression. Okay, um, we have someone here, we uh, hand up Barbara, so I'm just going to ask to unmute and then she can ask the question herself. Yeah, I was, am I on? I think I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm in Amherst, about 60 miles from you, Kevin, south of you. Love your work on the tunnel. Um, I was just wondering, there was um, a statement by George Washington, who said that um, basically, we would not have won our freedom um, from the British without the Irish help, and it was now our turn to help the Irish win their freedom from Britain. Was there any, when you were doing your research, did you see any connection with Jefferson and George Washington and the United Ireland, anything along those lines? Not for, sorry, not for George Washington, but, but I wasn't specifically looking, Barbara. Uh-huh. And, and so that's an avenue that you, that you could that you could spend more time with. <laughs> you could become the expert on Washington and the United Irishmen if, if there's a connection. Right. Okay. Washington, Washington and Jefferson weren't the closest of friends. Right. Yeah. Just it was kind of interesting, you know, to hear that statement that you know George Washington accredited the fighting spirit of the Irish for helping win the revolution. And I think that's that's something that people in Ireland need to know that there was that correlation and understanding of how important the Irish were in our struggle here. No, oh, because a lot of a lot of the Irish of that era were um, whether they were, were of the educated classes or 
on the, on the, on the dirty fingernail classes, you know, they, they had come over here because they wanted to, uh, to escape. They wanted a better life and anything that they could do to fight back, they would do, I think. Okay. Appreciate. Great. Thank you very much for that question. Anne has her hand up there. So it just, I'm going to Yes. Down. Thank you. Uh, should I go to video or no? Doesn't no, matter. no, it's up to you. Okay. No, um, I recently found the, my Irish immigrant and from what is written in several accounts, he left um, County Antrim 1798 because he was an orangeman and he had to get out by the skin of his teeth from what was written. And he did settle in Jefferson County, then Virginia. And one account in a local history says that he came to uh, landed in Baltimore. Now, for that time period, would they have come into Philadelphia? Would they have come into Baltimore or somewhere else? And, Baltimore, and, I would say, go ahead. Baltimore, and and I and I do see an account where he was in the linen trade, so possibly he was um, working with um, people in Virginia, maybe exporting from Ireland to Virginia. Um, the Dandridge family uh, at the Bowery is who he came to be an overseer for. But I guess that I really need to confirm not only the family uh, history, but the fact that he did own the land where the Earl of Antrim was situated. And then when the English took over, he lost the land. But then in the late 1800s, supposedly they were to inherit the get inherit the land again it, it's just a twisted tale and i'm i just feel good that i was able to confirm my grandmother's oral history that 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 was antrim and that was the time period so where should i go from here or can i see the um, estate records from antrim from the earl of antrim well here um if you want to give me a wee email later on i'll get back to you tomorrow you know okay. give me all the details, the details you have on them I, I, I can be my bit over here. I'd be fascinating to learn who he was, you know. Do you, do you have my email there from signing in or no? No, I don't. But I've just sent you a direct message there. Okay. So okay. You should Thank see you. it coming up. Okay. Oh, and I would like to add this, if you're, if you're still on. Um, around this part of Virginia, that name Sandridge, um, it's not exactly common, but there have been a number of people named Sandridge um, living in this part of, of the country. They, they usually tend to be um, have their own land and they farm, or they have in the last hundred years or so. And there's even a, um, a man named Sandridge who was like the chief fundraiser of the University of Virginia um, till recently. So the name Sandridge has made it around here. Don't know of any Sandridges that had anything to do with linen. In oh, no, Dandridge. It was Dandridge. Oh. D-A-N-D-R-I-D-G-E, -D -D -E, Dandridge. And the name, of, the name of the land was the Bowery. But my, my immigrant was Joseph Thompson. It'll be interesting to see what, what you and Stephen put to. I hope you come up with when you put your heads together. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, this, keep, this keeps me awake at night. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you very much, there. Um, okay, Jumbo, do you want to answer ask a wee question there? Yeah, may, mine might be a wee bit controversial. <laughs> in that uh, it's about two John Mitchells. Now, John Mitchell was a controversial figure in that he was um, part of the Confederacy. And he, he in oh. Ireland, he was a bit of a hero to a lot of people in Ireland in that he had been a, a freedom fighter here. He was one of, he was a, a leader of the, the Young Irelanders. Um, but also in the same area, there was uh, John Mitchell Jr. who was born a slave. Uh, and, uh, and both were editors and both, 
John Mitchell Jr. Uh, fought for uh, for black emancipation and for black freedom, whereas Mitchell it was a supporter of the Confederates. And I'm wondering, was there any connection between the two of them? Your way was John Mitchell Jr. a black slave called after? Was he called after John Mitchell? But would there be any connection there? That's my question. Well, I never read um, of any connection. But Mitchell was over here for a number of years. But Mitchell actually served time, prison time, in the town of Richmond um, for his support of the Confederacy. He was called a, a traitor by the um, by the federal government here, and he was given a number of months, I think, locked up. Now, because he was a himself was a supporter of slavery. Um, the point of turn of events. My first re reaction is that probably he wouldn't have had anything to do with black people at all. And those people who supported the Confederacy, a, a large number of them didn't fight physically, but a, a lot of them did fight. But a lot of them who didn't fight um, still looked down their noses at black people. And that's a kind way of, of looking at it. So I don't know, you're, you're on your own there. He didn't own any slaves himself. Um, but he was a propagandist for them. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. But it's just strange that a black a slave, <laughs> a black civil rights um, activist was called the same name as him, only John Mitchell Jr. Like, I think it's probably just a coincidence, but I was just wondering, was there? But thank you for your, your, uh, your talk was excellent. Thank you very much. I keep, keep looking into that. It'd be interesting if you can if you can find out an yeah. ironic connection, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jimbo. Um, I'll go on here to Amadeus now. Do you want to ask a question? Amadeus, you're up. Um, pronouncing the name correctly. Most people make it an absolute bollocks of it, so thanks a million. I appreciate that. Um, over here in the States, in, in New England, I've got a master's degree in American history, so this is a fascinating thing. I live over here and try to do back and forth connection. I have on this call uh, a young man named Matthew Bailey, and Matt and I are trying to do as much research as we can. His background, he's from West Virginia, and so I appreciate that's slightly different, but we're here to try to, you know, begin a little documentary. We're going to try to make him a filmmaker about the Irish connection. And if you want to talk about that offline, what we're trying to do, please, by all means, contact me. But our starting point for this mission is West Virginia. So can you give me any kind of indication of where I might want to start? Thank you. Well, you know, you could start by the realization that in the 1860s, people living in the Western part of Virginia because Virginia was really a vast state then. It went all the way to the Ohio River, as you may know. A great many of the people who lived in the western part of the state said, we will have nothing to do with slavery. We don't like the eastern Virginia people who are, are, make, are making a lot of money on the backs of slaves. So we'll have nothing to do with that. And so they split off and in the 1860s and set up their their own their own little county which tends to be very hilly and mountainous as opposed to the basically flat piedmont of the rest of virginia so is amadeus is that a good place to start i mean I can't answer. Uh, not really no I'm, I'm i'm looking at this as a filmmaking a story i'm trying to find um Places where you can find the Scots Irish, in particular, Ulster Scots, is that we're meant to call them Scots Irish, the film over here, uh, in that far part of West Virginia, the psychology as to why they split, were there any Irish involved in that from this part of the world? We're just going to dive into that uh, experience in itself. It may be a thing, like I said, <clears throat> for us to take offline, I have got a much deeper synopsis of what we're trying to achieve here, but I would like to figure out where to make that connection start. So maybe. Um, Kevin, if you're available, I am here in the States. We take a phone call and talk about it. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. What's, yeah. what's your number? Is that possible to send it over on a message? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what, why don't you email me first? 
Perfect. What's that? It's just to have the, the the record. Perfect. Do you have Do you have the email from from Stephen? If you uh, email the Transnatura page, we'll send you Kevin's email. I'll throw it through Facebook. Okay, I I thank you for your time. Sorry to take up so much of your time, but hopefully we can kind of miss some things. Well, this is fascinating, and I've been recording it, and I really appreciate it. Have a nice day, guys. Cheers. Thank you, Amadeus. Cheers. Okay, um, Colin would like to come on with a question about the solvents. Yes, Kevin, and greetings all the way from County Wicklow in Ireland. And my question is, I've done some ancestral testing. My father is from the Barra Peninsula in Cork. And through this testing and through tools like GEDmatch and matching with various American cousins, we discovered our connection would be the Sullivans, some of the Sullivans that went to Lynn Haven Parish in Virginia in the 17th century. And I'm wondering if you have any interesting information on this particular Sullivan branch, because as far as we understand, they're connected to the Sullivan bear, uh, at least some of the Sullivan bears who, who left Ireland in the 17th century. Oh. Oh, you're dealing with a really early period, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Where do I start? Why don't, why don't you and I email a little bit too, Colin? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I have my, my grandmother's from Donegal. So usually when I get matches in the southern part of the States, it tends to be Ulster Scott or nor northern side. But I've had quite a few Sullivan matches in the southern states, including Virginia, which has to be from my dad's side. So, yeah. Well, well that could be interesting, both for yourself and for my, myself as well, Colin, you know? Yeah, because I believe some of these Sullivans are connected to one of the founding fathers. I could be wrong. Is there a General, General John Sullivan or something like this? I could be wrong. When, well, in the interim, um, did you pick it, pick up earlier that I was talking about um, another little research group that I belong to, Clan Moore or Clan Vor? No, I did. Maybe, maybe I missed that. Hmm. All right. Well, the, it, it's a it's a small organization, and it's Clan Moore. Well, we spell pronounce it Clan Moore. C L A N N M H O R. Yeah dot org right now I, when maybe you have a chance i want you to go to that website and once you're on the home page look up to the top and among the five or six titles music and articles and, and whatever um, i want you to click on research right and when you do that column um you'll be taken to a page that has 10 or 12 <clears throat> different fascinating things about the Irish in Virginia who were working on the railroad. And I want you to go down and click on the master list of all the Irish working on the tunnels, right. railway tunnels in Virginia. And when you're there, it's a spreadsheet that's alphabetical. So you can just dial down, zip down, scroll down till you get to both the O'Sullivans and the Sullivans. Right. And, 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 and there are a lot, of, a lot of them there. And that's a good, good place, I think. <clears throat> Sorry. That's a good place for, um, for you and me to start. And we can email back and forth. Fantastic. Yeah, because I've, I've seen actually some of them, at least one of them, seem to change their name to Sullivant with a T for some reason. There were wild spellings. Yeah. Of, uh, of that name, sometimes with a PH, and so, sometimes with, if you don't didn't know the name that you were looking at, you would uh, you'd be confused. Yeah, you wouldn't get it at all. That's great, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Thank oh, let you. me let me let me tackle on this one of the one of the um, frustrating things that that we in in Clonmore or Clonvore found out was that when when cholera hit all those Irish railway, railway workers. And this was in the 1850s then. I think, I think the specific year was 1854. Of the ones who got um, killed within a week by the cholera, it really hit hard. 
the great bulk of them were Sullivans or O'Sullivans. And and they and they got taken out very, very fast. And they were all, in case you were interested, they were all, they were all living in, in in tiny little, tiny little little huts on the eastern, uh, the eastern side of the long tunnel. Right. The long tunnel goes through, through the mountain and starts on the east side and goes through to what's called the west side of the mountain. And, and, and these O'Sullivan's living and working, banging away, trying to make headway through the, the hard green granite. And when the, when the cholera hit, um, it just took out more O'Sullivan's than, than anybody else. And I have a theory about that. I think it's a brilliant theory. It's brilliant too. And, and we can talk about that in the in the email too. That's awesome. I'm really I'm really interested in in following 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 up on 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 this chat with you. Great, thanks a lot. Me too. Thanks for that, Nay. Okay, uh, we have one more question, and then we'll let you head on, Kevin. Okay, Carbs. Yeah. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Who did you, you ask? Krebs. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm Krebs. Maynard G. You? Krebs. Remember that name? Maynard G. Krebs. <laughs> are, are you joking me? No. Maynard from 50 or 60 Maynard years G. ago. Maynard G. Krebs. You know, the yeah, Dobie yeah. Gillis show. Way yeah. back when. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Forget it. It went over your head. No, all, all I was trying I to say good. is that you people were talking about West Virginia. What what do you have in West Virginia? You have coal, C O A L, coal, and that's what most of the people in West Virginia shoveled out all of that coal that got shipped to around the country. It was the West West Virginia people, and they were looked down by the people in Virginia. That's the right. difference, you know. And and a lot of Irish were up in that area, you know. Check out, I I want to say you, you I think you've said the name McGuire. Well, I think that's where the people with the name McGuire are from up in West Virginia. I might be wrong, but there is some name. I'd have to go back and research it, but go back and 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 there was a an Irish family who um, who fought the fought the law and the law won uh, kind of situation. But they they were a tough group of people, and they were West Virginia coal miners. True, quite true. And that and that was back in the you know in the 18, 1800s. Well, right up until today, you know, they're still pulling coal out of that, out of the hills. Well, in but fact, you have a lot of black lung out there. A terrible thing to die of. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? I had my say. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Krabs, it's great. Um, so I think we'll just uh, stop it here now. Um, Kevin, thank you very much for coming on to Trasatera. It's very good of you. Um, it was a fascinating lecture. And I think we all learned something. We bit more added to our own knowledge, you know. And I just thank everybody for coming on tonight and everybody watching on YouTube and Facebook. It's very good of you. Thank you. I'll just close her up now. Love. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick Kevin. Just end it all. All the best now.